Thank you for tuning into our seller interview series. Up today, we've got an e-commerce and dropshipping business for sale in the home accessories niche. Created in March of 2017, this business makes $3,624 per month in net profit, and the listing number for the business is 44583. We do these interviews to give potential buyers more information about both the seller and the businesses they're looking to purchase. We hope these insights are helpful for you in making a buying decision. We've got the seller with us today to go through the business and cover everything from niche selection to traffic and monetization. How are you doing today, Yuri? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you on here today. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Pleasure is all mine, Jake. Before we get started here, I want to go ahead and run through a little quick summary of the business. The business was built in March of 2017 has a monthly revenue of $66,387, expenses of $62,763 to make for net profit of $3,624, which is generated on a 12-month average. Included in the sale of this business are the primary domain in all site content and files, second site in the similar niche, email list of approximately 50,000, Facebook page, full automation that is already built out, vendor relationship. Please note that inventory is not normally included in the list price, Further details can be provided to active depositors. Yuri, can you tell us a little bit about your background in building and running online businesses? Absolutely. So I've been in the online space for about 10 years now. I started back in 2006, humbly on ClickBank with Google AdWords products, rather on ClickBank products, marketing on Google AdWords. I started off as a media buyer and then slowly moved into a little bit more heavier entrepreneurship. I started Facebook advertising approximately one year ago. Fast forward, you know, nine years now, and I started Facebook advertising really much more heavily than I have done before. I come from a pretty heavy pay PPC background, especially on AdWords, managing some ad accounts running thirty million dollars a year. That's approximately fifty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars a day in ad spend. So I'm pretty accustomed to large ad budgets, and they don't really scare me. Coming onto the Facebook platform was especially an interesting experience because of the multitude of targeting options available. Right around when I started Facebook advertising is the same time I started delving into a little bit more into e-commerce. And this is more personal e-commerce as opposed to running things on eBay or captive platforms like eBay or Amazon. I started my own website that is what is currently on sale now. And when you started the business, how did you come up with the idea to start this specific business? So we've run many, many product tests and we tried different angles, different approaches, different ad styles. Based on all of our tests, and to be honest, we were dropshipping off of AliExpress for a period of time in this business, but we started on a different domain that's not listed here. But we started dropshipping from AliExpress with that domain, uh, just gathering, experiencing, and understanding product tests. When we started this particular business, it was actually an accident. We were running some remnant ads and noticed some really interesting numbers on this particular product line, decided to investigate it further. Uh, Upon investigating it further, things started picking up and we started getting pretty good ROI. And from there, we started scaling. And how does the business primarily make money? So initially, we started off with Facebook advertising. We have our own actual Facebook strategy and Facebook methodology at this point. But we started off pretty standard like everybody else. We started Facebook advertising. We started pretty standard campaigns and campaign formats, different types of ad placements, etc. At this point, however, the business generates revenue based off of both Facebook advertising, the email automation, the bot automations that are built into it. So it has multiple streams of income at this point. But when we first started, there was a singular stream of income, and that would be directly through the Facebook ads channel. And why did you choose this particular monetization method versus Amazon FBA? So with Facebook, we have a little bit more freedom than FBA. We actually are able to capture the user's email and address information as well as their phone number. We're able to remarket to those users on the Facebook platform as well. So we have a lot more freedom as far as what we do with the user's information and how we market to them. In addition, Facebook offers a multitude of targeting options that allow us to really outline our marketing plan and really hit the right user at the right time so we get the most amount of revenue from each individual person. We chose Facebook primarily because One, it's very flexible. Two, we have full control of our advertising, our data, and our acquisition. And three, it has a little faster speed to market. We can get a product up and running in 24 hours versus on Amazon, it takes a little bit more product development, got to get barcodes, et cetera, et cetera. With Facebook, you could just start a store, start running traffic to it immediately, and not have to wait so long to get any results. 
Why have you decided to sell this business today instead of keeping it and growing it yourself? We've come across several hurdles in our own personal lives, not necessarily with the business. The business is still very profitable for us and we can scale it. However, we've decided to turn our attention to other product lines due to the fact that we just have a little bit more interest in horizontal scaling. We want to try out new things. In addition to that, we're starting to take on a little bit of client work and consulting work that's eating up a lot of the time, minimizing the amount of time we have available to manage this business and actually scale it further. We have a, a plan and strategy to scale it. However, it's just time intensive and we just don't want to go down that road at this point. So we want to instead focus our energy on a new product line and use our skill set and our available resources to manage something new. In other words, we just want to try some new things and because this business is where it's at, it does still take some time to manage it and it does still take some time to operate it. We've sort of matured out of this business and outgrown it. And that definitely makes sense and sounds fair. You want to pursue other ventures. But as I mentioned before, this business was created in March of 2017. And if you take a look back over the last year, over 2017, you notice that pretty smooth sailing, making a lot in profit. And then in September of last year, there was a loss on the business. So what happened in September of last year? So we were coming right out of August, and that was from our big scaling month, and we hit it really hard. I think the number we did in August was $136,000 in revenue. We Coming off of that, we sort of exhausted our audience reach at that point. We really aggressively scaled it during that August month. September hit us hard because, one, my availability was diminished due to traveling and other circumstances surrounding just my personal life, and two, Facebook's algorithm tends to change fairly often. I mean, We've noticed that the methodology that we were implementing in August was no longer effective in September, so it required us to pivot. Conveniently, Facebook typically does an upgrade or a modification to their platform every quarter, the beginning of every quarter. So that put us in a precarious spot where we had to adjust and pivot. So September was primarily filled with testing new strategies to determine what's actually going to work in the fourth quarter in the market so that we can position ourselves for the holiday shopping season. So the reason is... We were testing, and testing requires money. And where do the large majority of the expenses for the business go? At this point, the majority of the expenses are going to Facebook advertising. But like I said, over the last year, we've been able to develop a strategy that allows us to more or less be very steady with our ad spend and not as aggressive. So we're not hitting the craziest numbers, but I think our profitability is much higher now. So from a percentage standpoint, we're more profitable now than we used to be, but our revenue is significantly less. Is there anything that you really learned along the way? Were there any big bumps in the road when growing this business? Yes. Number one, suppliers. The biggest issue we dealt with in the very beginning and early on in the business before we established a, a one uh, sort of one-channel supplier, before we established a, re- a good relationship with the working supplier of the product and the inventory would be willing to ship for us. So though we are a drop shipping business, they are our only supplier. We only work, require one relationship with them, and it's pretty easy to manage. We submit orders, they fulfill them, we get tracking numbers, et cetera. The biggest bump in the road, I'd say, in the early stages was finding a good, reliable supplier that allows us to that allows us to scale aggressively and has a volume that can handle the volume we would throw at them. So that was really the first hurdle. And the second hurdle was managing the customer service. Facebook aside, that was a a strategy in and of itself, but managing the customer service and making sure that our customer service team is aware of how to handle returns uh, and customer issues and different circumstances, creating different buckets for each type of customer who would eventually come to us, make a purchase or have issues with our products or with our services, we would be able to handle them appropriately. So the customer service was the second hurdle we had to cross and we have created documentation, handbooks and training in order to fulfill that need. And the third thing was claim management. In the early early stages, when we didn't have a good vendor, a good supplier for the product, we had a lot of claims because shipments would go missing, other people would be complaining with drop shipping, etc. So we got off of that model very quickly, and we managed our claims by training up our customer service teams so that they know how to submit claims appropriately. We never really had any merchant issues. We never really had any monetary issues from that standpoint. Like I said, the biggest three things that we had to do was one, vendor, two, customer service, and three, claims management. When you talk about the Facebook advertisement, it 
seems like the Facebook ads make up the large majority of your traffic. Do you get traffic for the business on any other platform? Yes, we're starting to get traffic off of YouTube and we're starting to get traffic off of organic traffic on the other domain that's more our SEO domain. So it's optimized to be indexed organically. Uh, We have gotten organic sales off of it. So we certainly do have traffic off of other platforms. We are running ads off of Google as well. However, we have future plans to expand reach outside of Facebook's networks. But currently, we're like I said, it's a time-intensive thing, and we're in the middle of a project, so we don't have enough resources to scale again. So we do get a little bit of traffic. I wouldn't say the bulk of our traffic is still coming from Facebook advertising. However, based on our strategy, it's fairly steady. Let's say, hypothetically, you keep the business. So when talking about scaling this business, what is your first step? The first step for scaling this business is establishing a private label. We have the designs and packaging available, and we also have the supplier available who's willing to private label for us. We even have the warehouse that's willing to fulfill for us. The next logical step is to uh, bring in inventory in-house in a warehouse, ship it with our shipping warehouse, our shipper, our ship supplier, and then actually utilizing our branding and start branding the product as our own product, not as the current vendor's product, but currently our own product with our labeling, our logos, et cetera, our branding. From there, we can start scaling in other areas such as influencer marketing. We can start utilizing uh, rev shares or joint ventures with other people who have high clout or high degree of followers. What are some of the other opportunities for growth that you want a new owner to know that they can take advantage of? Sure. So the other opportunities for growth, of course, you can scale on Google AdWords. We haven't really investigated that too much. We haven't investigated SEO as well. So those two channels are still very ripe. We haven't really done a whole lot of Instagram as well. And we haven't built our own influencer branding. Basically, the biggest thing you can do for this business right now is establish a brand authority on the Internet. Once you establish brand authority on the internet, getting into retail, actual physical sales, retail channels will be much easier because you already have brand awareness on the internet. From there, you can scale horizontally into other product lines and own additional product lines. We actually had a recurring income model built into our flow that we accumulated approximately 200 customers at our peak in our recurring model. We decided to stop that piece because We wanted to figure out a more profitable recurring model based off of what we were doing. In addition to that, we wanted to have our products and our inventory in-house. So we didn't want to drop ship any recurring business. So there's many opportunities here. And it's just a matter of focusing, honing in, and figuring out what the right products and the right positioning would be. Um, In addition to that, uh, branding would be a huge benefit for this business. What are some risks that you see a new owner encountering with this business? Staying on only Facebook, there's always a risk on only a singular traffic source because traffic sources may change, audiences may change, they're dynamic. So you can't rely on one singular traffic source for all your sales unless you're diversifying your assets across that channel, which is what we've done. You don't have the same guaranteed income as you do if you were to diversify across other channels. So one of the biggest risks I see is staying with Facebook for the next, I'd say, two, three years. I don't think Perhaps it would be steady. I don't know what the future holds for Facebook, but certainly better to build an internal brand and spend less money on advertising, bringing, scaling that budget back and relying more on partnerships and influencers as well as people who have a little bit more clout in the space, who have a little bit more pull with audiences. So I think partnerships would be a good diversification. So that the biggest risk is just a singular traffic source. Oh, in addition to that, a singular vendor is also a slightly risk. We've had no issues with our current vendor. They've been actually very, very good to us. They're very responsive. We get our shipments out in approximately five days. However, if they decide to change their model or decide to stop drop shipping, that is something to be considering. And that's why we decided to bring our own inventory in-house. What was the work like for you when you first started this business? You know, Take me through the journey of how that evolved as the business grew. There's multiple stages of it. The first one was Shopify. So we had the Shopify era where we were basically hands-off on the website. We were just testing products. From the Shopify, we moved into WooCommerce. And WooCommerce, my background's already in WordPress, so I have a lot of knowledge in, in how to build WooCommerce stores. Utilizing and leveraging WooCommerce was a little tricky at first because we really didn't have the right resources, the right plugins, the right 
components to make WooCommerce successful or have the right capabilities like Shopify. So in the beginning, a lot of it was development time. It was a lot of time figuring out what's going to work, how to get flows working in WooCommerce, how to get the actual store looking the way you want it to, how to modify certain elements of the store, et cetera, et cetera. Building out the store from a UI UX standpoint, that was a fairly large hurdle. And then figuring out the flows and the customer service, how to handle uh, different orders and what happens to each order and how to process orders. Figuring out the basic flows of everything and the processes internally that was a big challenge for us. And then finally, figuring out the automation sequences and making sure that they all speak to each other. So they're not disjointed automation sequence where users can get multiple emails from multiple automation sequences. They're all inclusive. In other words, each automation sequence allows you to, it only sends one email style per user so that users are not seeing multiple emails per day. The email sequences and the automation sequences convert the user from a cold lead to a warm lead to a, eventually a buyer, and then from there it nurtures the, the buyers automatically. And that was really a challenge to figure out how we're actually going to do that, how we're going to kick users, if let's say they opt into a newsletter, how do we make them into a customer list? How do we put them into a customer flow and then remove them from the newsletter flow? So those hurdles were certainly very challenging to cross. And then, of course, establishing vendor relationships. When you're running a drop shipping business and you don't have a dedicated vendor who's willing to support you in your venture, you're basically scrambling all the time and trying to figure out how you're going to fulfill these items for the customers. You have the order volume, you don't have the actual fulfillment site established. So that was another piece that was very challenging for us to get going in the beginning. It took a lot of phone calls, took a lot of negotiation. It was very challenging for us to establish a vendor relationship. And in fact, we got denied two times from them. It took a little bit of emailing back and forth, phone calls, and finally we got to in contact with the right person there who helped us establish a relationship with the vendor that we already have now. Like I said, we got denied initially from them, but because of his relationship, he was sort of more internal and has a little bit more pull within the company. He allowed us to actually start dropshipping with them, even though we denied, we were completely denied and no new vendors are actually dropshipping with this organization now. I think a direct quote from the CEO was that we were actually one of their hottest sales channels. So we were overtaking basically all of the other dropshippers that were working with this company. So that was establishing this relationship with the vendor was fairly challenging because they were very hesitant to work with us at first because we kind of came out of nowhere. We started, the volume that we had was sort of, you know, they didn't believe us at first until we showed them screenshots of our numbers. So that was a fairly challenge, fairly large challenge for us. But finally we got in there. In the beginning, I'd say I was pulling in about 60 to 80 hour weeks between development, management, operations, and advertising, and strategy. But now that we're fully automated, uh, the commitment is just far, far less. And that's something that we've mentioned before, and you just mentioned it again, full automation. So I do want to touch on what exactly does that mean? How much time do you have to touch the business yourself? So there's two phases in the day-to-day -day operation. There's the, the ad campaign launches and then the ad campaign killing. So we basically turn on, turn off campaigns. And we have a strategy that we follow that's pretty well documented, which we will reveal once we have the right buyer. But in any case, our strategy allows us basically, it's a very consistent approach. So anybody can learn it. It's just a matter of like training somebody on it. That strategy takes about five to 10 hours a week. And then between operations, maybe another five to seven hours per week. What I mean by full automation is after the user enters the website, if we have their email, we'll start email marketing them immediately. If we don't have their email, we'll remarket them on Facebook. So they're immediately getting multiple touch points as soon as they visit our website. And these campaigns are already built out. So there's no additional requirement from anybody to actually manage these particular campaigns. The retargeting and the email retargeting, those are already built out. So customers enter a flow. They get several emails and then eventually convert into a customer and then enter a post-sale flow. So we have a pre-sale flow, a post-sale flow, and then a nurture flow as well. And then from that sequence lasts about 45 days. And then we have basically the buckets. And those are weekly drip campaigns that are more relevant to like time. So like promotions are like Independence Day is coming up, Christmas, other holidays, other U.S. national holidays. Those are more campaign styles and are not automation campaigns, but they're just more so those are the non-automation pieces. So everything else, for the most part, the emails and the advertising, the customers are already going to, going to have multiple touch points as soon as they hit the website. Would you commit to a non-compete? Yes. 
It depends on the non-compete. I mean, if it's a non-compete saying that we're not allowed to do e-commerce, no. But if it's a non-compete with this product line, I have no. With this niche, the product line, yeah, um, this fine. particular business, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I would assume that anybody, <laughs> anybody buying the business would want that, yes. Mm -hmm. How much support are you willing to offer a buyer during the transition period? We are willing to offer a consulting package. I imagine it's going to be about 20 hours a week at first in consulting just to figure out what exactly the buyer's uh, skill set and abilities are. If they're really well versed in, in Facebook advertising or advertising in general, then I believe the learning curve will be fairly low. They're just going to have to follow our strategy and you know implement. If they don't know a thing about Facebook advertising, obviously the commitment's going to be a little bit higher. But it's not impossible either way. Like I said, it's pretty much we're training. We actually are training an intern to manage this for us, and he has very limited Facebook experience, but he's actually understanding and he's already doing it on his own. So he's already basically launching and killing the ads all on his own. And we took him about three weeks to learn it. So I imagine if we do 20 hours a week for the first two to three weeks, whoever purchases the business, because we have all the documentation, it's not going to take long for them to get up to speed. But we are certainly willing to support the new buyer in this venture, so long as they're willing to learn and implement. What response have you seen since this new manager took over? Has there been an increase in traffic, conversion rates, you know, stuff like that? Certainly, yeah. Actually, the other day we actually had a very profitable day, which is very typical for Wednesday. So we had we did make approximately what we would usually make on the weekends. We basically had eight x return from our ad spend. So we spent approximately a hundred bucks. We returned almost a thousand dollars on our revenue, which doesn't say much, but our profit margins are over fifty five percent. So you know we clocked in about six hundred bucks, seven hundred bucks just on that day. It's um. He took over. I think more so he's stabilized and he's been able to replicate our results. He hasn't done anything that's that impressive yet, but he has certainly stabilized the business and he's just implementing the day-to-day -day work. So he's reduced a lot of the day-to-day -day work that we have to do. Are you open to discussing something like an earnout? Yes. So Yuri, is there anyone who inspired you while you were building this business that our listeners might like as well? <laughs> if you know who Ezra Firestone is, of course, he's the guru of e-commerce or the current guru, if you want to call him that. So I was inspired by multiple people. I've been in the online world for a long time, so I've seen a lot of money change hands. But for this particular venture, I got started with John Max training courses. From there, I got introduced to Ezra Firestone's courses. I never took any of his courses, but I got some of his PDFs and downloads and things. And basically, a lot of trial and error. We built the business pretty much based on data. The two inspirational people for me initially were John Mack and Ezra Firestone. What advice would you give our listeners that you wish you knew when you started out? <laughs> Don't listen to the gurus. <laughs> I know it's what I just said before, before that statement is listening to gurus. Their situation and your situation are always going to be unique. So you don't know how much time it took them to get to where they are. So the advice that they're giving you may or may not be relevant to your business. Of course, the strategies should be relevant to you. But in oftentimes the case is their situation doesn't match yours. So you can't replicate their success because you weren't exposed to what they were exposed to. So every situation is very unique. That's my first piece of advice. And the second piece of advice is, I wouldn't look at everybody else's revenue numbers and be all shocked about millions and millions of dollars in revenue because I personally know people who've generated millions of dollars in revenue, but they spent 1.5 to get that. So they actually had a net loss of 500 just to get, in addition to the expenses for operating business and product costs, just to show a quote case study. So I always like to see the real entrepreneurs, the real gurus are those people you've never heard about. Those people who are sort of behind the scenes, they're the ones pulling the strings. Those are the people you want to be talking to and networking with. Otherwise, you never know what the truth truly is. You never know if the numbers that they're portraying are actually profitable or if they're actually being truthful and they're not trying to deviate you from the actual strategy that they're using just so they can you know, avoid competition. Is there anything you would like to share that we haven't discussed yet today? And the answer can be no. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, I think I've covered quite a bit. <laughs> awesome. I do have one final question for you, Yuri, but before we get to that, I want to go ahead and run through that quick summary of the business again. Yep. The business was built in March of 2017, has a monthly revenue of $66,387, expenses of $62,763 to make for a net profit of $3,624, which is generated on a 12-month average. 
Included in the sale of this business are the primary domain and all site content and files, second site and similar niche, email list of approximately 50,000, Facebook page, full automation that is already built out, and a vendor relationship. Please note that inventory is not normally included in the list price. Further details can be provided to active depositors. Yuri, can you give me, in your own words, your best 30-second pitch on why this is a business worth buying? Look, you can start your own e-commerce dropshipping business, and you can go through all the struggles and frustrations the same way we did, and I have no doubt you'll be successful. We've already gone through all the processes. In fact, we built something that most people don't even see. We built it on WooCommerce, not Shopify. We have a one-vendor relationship versus AliExpress. We have raving fans. Our shipping time is fast. You can go ahead and test all your products and figure out what's working in the marketplace, or you can dive right in and start scaling a business that's already working. Awesome. Yuri, thank you so much for taking the time today and sharing some of your insights on how you grew a successful business. I really appreciate you taking the time today. No problem. Thank you so much for your time as well, Jake. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. And if you want more information, the link will be below the video that will take you to this marketplace listing. If you're watching this on the listing site and want more information, become a depositor today. When you make the deposit, one of our business advisors will be in contact with you. You'll be given everything you need to review this business. Have a great day.